Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are in Palace One, and the name of this talk is Press Route to Continue Detecting OSX and Windows Botnets with RDU, excuse me, RDFU. I'm going to hand you over to your presenters. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mario Vuxan, and uh, we're here to talk about actually uh, bootkits uh, for UFI. Uh, and uh, really, you know, again, you know, I thank people for moving forward. Unfortunately, the UFI is not, you know, tabloid uh, sized, uh, and uh, also it's not in Technicolor, so uh, you know, letters will be smaller, and uh, there'll be definitely lack of color. Uh, but uh, we nevertheless, you know, find it very exciting and interesting. And I would like to first begin by first telling you more in terms of how we're going to structure this talk. We are obviously interested in telling you more about our motivation. EFI is not everybody's cup of tea. It's not really uh, uh, written about all that much, although in the last few years you know, we are seeing more and more research. We also would like to talk to you more about who we are as we have been uh, regularly speaking in Black Hat, you know, releasing various open source projects. And uh, uh, we find you know, this research being relevant extension of what we've been doing. Uh, also, we uh, like to then follow up uh, with a sort of you know brief introduction to EFI. I'm sure you know a lot of you are very uh, familiar with it, uh, but nevertheless, it's sort of you know good sort of you know to uh, to set the stage and then also to mention some of the previous uh, UFI bootkit uh, uh, research. Uh, some of it presented at uh, Black Hat, uh, very good material uh, that uh, uh, was certainly uh, influential in our own work. Uh, and uh, then we want to get into the actually uh, presenting uh, the rootkit detection framework or what we called RDFU uh, by uh, looking at the framework design, uh, thinking, of, you know, discussing uh, 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 reasons uh, that uh, uh, were behind its uh, structure and then also uh, going through the VMware implementation uh, demo. And then obviously, uh, uh, every good defense measure uh, comes uh, with a proof of uh, uh, proof of concept uh, uh, material uh, to validate it. So uh, we will, uh, at the end of the talk, uh, demonstrate the macOS uh, uh, 10 uh, uh, bootkit. Now, um, to start with, it's really uh, our motivation, and so uh, we as a company. Uh, have always been very much interested in the uh, file-borne threats, uh, deep file analysis. And uh, after having spent a lot of time with Windows, with, uh, with ELF, uh, documents, firmware, mobile packages, we really said like, you know, hey, you know, it would be really, really interesting to do a deeper dive uh, in, uh, on the firmware level. Uh, so uh, we obviously noticed that you know you know UEFI's uh, popularity these days is really paramount as it runs on uh, Windows platform. You know runs under Android, runs uh, under macOS, and it's actually uh, everywhere. And not just only that, it's uh, everywhere. It's extremely powerful. Uh, UEFI today is uh, in a full stack uh, OS. You know it has uh, all the cool things you would want out of an OS to allow you to write really really cool applications sitting atop of it, and obviously Obviously, it's extremely, extremely interesting uh, for exploitation at that point. So it has a, a special uh, a set of powerful, you know, memory and file mani manipulation features. It has a full network stack, which is definitely, you know, very, very uh, important, you know, for the the, the uh, uh, exploitation. But then also it has lots of really other cool things, uh, such as graphic APIs. So you can imagine, you know, the, the, the vulnerability research in that area could be extremely, extremely useful. Uh, has a great, you know, device management uh, capability, and then also has the ability to do a remote boot. So you pretty much have all the elements uh, to be able to do uh, really, really interesting and wonderful um, uh, attacking uh, components. Now, uh, beyond these set of features, uh, UFI is really attacker's paradise because the defenders definitely have a lot of disadvantages in the area. You know, uh, it has definitely low visibility because there's very few tools that actually do anything about it, detect any presence or malformation or uh, invalid traffic originating specifically from the UFI stack. Uh, then also, uh, if you were actually trying to investigate uh, uh, malicious uh, firmware image, you know, here a malicious UEFI image, 
it would be very difficult for you to set up a, you know, a nice off-the-shelf uh, tool stack. Largely, you would have to build your own things. It would be extremely painful. A lot of stuff would be you know, hardware connected. Uh, it, you know, odds would be get stacked against you in actually trying to easily and quickly analyze what's happening. Of course, uh, you know there, you know there are in, in this story lots of you know, uh, you know also uh, good positive elements. I mean, EFI has been around, uh, uh, has been developed here, you know, almost in vacuum from actually you know in-depth you know security uh, analysis. Uh, but you know what we have seen with the EFI Secure Boot, especially uh, on some Android devices and Surface RT, is definitely very promising. It's a much higher uh, uh, security strength that we have ever seen on UEFI, and we are really hoping that that most of the new uh, devices will be uh, shipping with uh, Secure Boot uh, enabled. Now, a uh, few words about who we are. Uh, so the company was fo founded, you know, by two of us. You know, me, Mario Vuxan, and Tomis Laperchin over here. Uh, we started the company in in '09, and uh, our focus has always been a deep binary analysis of a wide range of uh, executable uh, formats. And uh, while doing the analysis, we really tried to pull out as much uh, material. Uh, out of those formats, specifically trying to understand uh, the reputation of various components, uh, malformations, and uh, different anomaly uh, detections. Now, uh, in our process of developing some commercial products, we have uh, been very, very uh, interested in uh, uh, developing a wider range of open source and freeware tools. We started in 09 with something that's called uh, a Titan Engine, which is a really uh, a library for portable executable format reconstruction and has been successfully used by various organizations in building, you know, from uh, 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 custom unpackers uh, to vulnerability scanners and even some, you know, pen testing uh, uh, projects. Then uh, we really uh, took a deeper dive into archive uh, formats. Uh, we released uh, in 2010 something called Nix Engine, which was the archive format Stego detection tool. Uh, something that uh, only recently, with uh, uh, Blue Box uh, Android uh, announcements, uh, has actually come a full circle. We have realized that we have had a tool to uh, detect uh, uh, these really more like you know uh, uh, stego hiding you know artifacts inside of you know Android uh, APKs, and uh, we believe that there is, this is sort of you know really interesting area to go back to and try to see how the archive formats actually uh, can uh, be misused you know in an executable uh, environment. Uh, following our next engine, we tried to put together an open source uh, platform for actually uh, unpacker writing, analysis of uh, uh, Windows binaries, which we then followed with an uh, unofficial guide to uh, uh, P malformation. Probably some of, the, some, some of you uh, came to that talk a couple of years ago. We were really, really surprised how many people were uh, 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 excited you know, about you know, always new things that you uh, can uh, uh, learn from PE, you know. So for us, it that format never ceases to uh, surprise us. And then last year, uh, we uh, uh, we started uh, a project that was our first uh, cooperation with the DARPA CFT program, uh, and we have released uh, something called the File Disinfection Framework, which uh, is an uh, open source platform that allows people to actually write disinfectors, uh, uh, you know, disinfection, disinfectors for various you know, file uh, infection uh, attacks uh, under Windows. And this obviously brings us you know, to this year's uh, uh, work that, uh, on UEFI that has also been uh, uh, funded by uh, uh, DARPA CFT. So having said that, obviously we would love to uh, thank DARPA CFT for being such a great program that has allowed us to work on things that were, you know, things that we are really interested in that we wanted to do but were slightly outside of our, you know, commercial uh, 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 offering but nevertheless uh, uh, relevant topics for the uh, community in general. Uh, also, we would like to, uh, you know, explicitly thank to, uh, you know, several researchers that have influenced uh, uh, this presentation and whose work we'll be citing uh, as we uh, uh, set the stage for uh, talking uh, deeper about the RDFU. So we want to thank to John Heisman, who spoke at Black Hat in 2007. Uh, we want to uh, thank to Snare from Assurance, who spoke last year. Really great talk 
uh, here at Black Hat. We also like to uh, thank to Dan Griffin, who spoke uh, only a couple days later at DEF CON, and Sebastian Kaczmarek, who had an interesting uh, 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 bootkit uh, talk at the Hack in the Box in Amsterdam uh, just you know uh, a few months ago. So without further ado, further ado, I uh, uh, in, want to introduce you Tomislav, and he'll uh, continue with the UFI. Hello, uh, my name is Tomislav Peruchin. I'm the chief software architect at Reversing Labs. I'm the guy behind, uh, well, the uh, one of the guys behind all of the projects uh, Mario has mentioned so far. Uh, today we are focusing on the UFI and our latest project, which is sponsored by DARPA. Uh, so how? does the booting process look today on machines that do not have UFI? So this is the old version of uh, loading the operating system. So you start with the BIOS which is the basic input output system. Uh, you load the uh, operating system through iterating through the uh, uh, the, the MBR that is all uh, executed in real mode. Uh, the control is then passed to the Windows components, uh, which uh, then you, uh, initialize the kernel, uh, run the other uh, hardware abstraction layers, uh, create uh, sessions, and so on. This is the old module, uh, which still is in use today on the older machines, but if you have bought a laptop or a PC recently, within the last couple of years, you most commonly have a thing called uh, unified uh, extensible firmware interface. So uh, what it is, it's, uh, it, it, it's a set of tools uh, that uh, enable uh, people who create devices to uh, really easily uh, create new protocols and support new, new devices. Uh, it was originally developed by Intel uh, with something which is called Intel Boot Initiative. Uh, it is being worked on ever since and it's uh, now grown into a community effort to modernize the PC booting process. Uh, it currently ships a as a boot option alongside uh, the standard legacy BIOS so you have to turn it on on most, uh, on, on most devices. When you choose to install an operating system, you have to have that turned on to be able to actually install uh, UFI. Uh, other operating systems like Windows also support uh, secure boot, so that enables you to have much more security when you're uh, installing an operating system to make sure that all of the components have not been tampered with uh, while you are uh, booting into your operating system. So uh, the UFI aims to be the future, uh, the only booting interface in the future. Uh, it is used today in all Intel, um, Intel powered uh, Mac, uh, MacBooks and uh, PC uh, as well. It is managed by the uh, Unified uh, Extensible Firmware Interface Consortium and uh, you can find and download the specs from their website. It's a pretty good read even though it's like 2,000 pages. Uh, there's quite a bit of uh, elements there uh, which you can find which are really interesting. Most of those were used for this particular talk which, uh, that enabled us to create RDFU. So how does the booting system change when there's unified uh, extensible firmware interface? So the only thing which actually changes is there's no more BIOS. All, all the firmware gets initialized by the UFI. Then, uh, the, then the UFI goes through the list of available devices, uh, loads the boot manager. In this case, uh, we've highlighted the Microsoft uh, boot manager, which then selects uh, which operating system uh, wants to, uh, it wants to load. Then all of the remaining things uh, happen as they were before in Windows. So the UFI is uh, something which uh, boots up the machine but uh, it also leaves the remnants running as long as the PC is powered on. So in a nutshell this is a conceptual overview of how this entire stack looks like. So on the top you would have the operating system and on the bottom you would have the EFI operating system loader which initialized the entire process. So the EFI uh, consists of the boot services which are really important, runtime services as well. So those are going to be the th things we talk about next. In addition to that, you have the underlying layers of the platform hardware, which is abstracted by the unified extens extensible interface uh, firmware, which enables you to uh, communicate with the devices to create new protocols and so on. All of that is contained on an uh, EFI partition, and that is actually installed by the operating system. So when you create uh, a new install of Windows, for example, you would basically get two new partitions, uh, one for the EFI layer and additional Windows uh, partition which actually is used for uh, storing additional Windows data. Uh, following that you have other, other uh, parts of the disk which are used uh, by the user. Uh, 
So the boot sequence uh, has changed a bit. So here is how it looks like today. All of the green items are the things that happen with, with uh, the boot manager's assistance. So you, you initialize the platform by loading the firmware and then the firmware takes off by loading other interesting things which need to be loaded like EFI drivers, uh, all of those drivers have, the, have an option of running additional applications and all of that is to assure that all of the devices you have on the machine are actually communicating properly. Uh, once uh, the booting process has completed, uh, the uh, the EFI search for the searches for the OS loader code, and it uh, boots up that spe specific application, which then uh, calls a, a, a function which terminates the booting services, which actually shuts down uh, part of the EFI uh, drivers, which are just meant to be running as uh, the device is booting. Uh, once that happens, the control is passed to the operating system, which then continues on normally. So with that in mind there are a couple of different things we should, we should really know about uh, UFI I, uh, images and that is that they are typically portable executables which are which is the mo most important thing for us because portable executable format is something we have been talking about in the past and this is just one subset of, uh, of that format. That's why this was of interest to us. But in addition to that the standard actually predicts there are other formats as well. So basically any vendor can create any kind of uh, executable format they want. Want. So Intel designed uh, this format called T uh, and it is being used by Apple as well in their implementation of the UFI. So even though UFI is a standard and anybody can uh, basically use any part of it and, and create a standard of their own, basically that includes the UFI uh, images as well. Uh, that was the case with, with the first version of the UFI uh, specification which was 1.10. Uh, the later uh, specification, so 2.0 which is the more, most more current is much more strict in that regard. So you have two uh, types of UFI images. You have drivers which uh, yet again there are two types of drivers. You have the boot service drivers which are actually terminated as soon as the operating system loader calls the exit boot services. So at that point all the drivers uh, are uh, which are just boot service drivers are unloaded from the system and the system is uh, uh, continues with the loading. You also have the uh, runtime service drivers which are present all the time so as long as the application or, or the system is running all of those uh, drivers are also running as well. So that uh, that becomes a really nice uh, way for you to inject any kind of code uh, which actually runs as long as the machine is running and that is what our project is focused on finding these images and uh, letting you know that they are present in the system. So those were the drivers. There are also applications. There are two types of applications like the normal applications that actually ex uh, exist and execute only in the pre-boot environment. I'm going to show you how that looks like in, uh, later on during the demo. And there's a specific uh, UFI application which just loads the operating system. And that's uh, the only kind of application which can actually take control of the system uh, by calling the exit boot services which then later on uh, unloads all the drivers uh, which are the boot service drivers. So uh, how do, do these programs communicate with the firmware? Uh, there's this thing called uh, boot services and, uh, and runtime services as well. So boot services are, you can think of it like a set of APIs which are available to developers which are actually creating programs that run in the UFI environment. And they consist of functions which are only available before the exit boot services is called. So this, these would be uh, the boot service drivers. So uh, they have functions which can be categorized as, as global so uh, they are available everywhere and they are also handle based which means that you can dynamically create protocols uh, by uh, applying many of these handle characteristics to uh, handles that are already open by opening other handles you basically create protocols. Uh, so we have uh, global functions uh, which are available on all platforms that is by uh, UFI specification. Uh, so you have event, uh, you, you can do basic tasks with, with these kinds of APIs like uh, create events, uh, timers, allocate some memory, uh, handle other protocols which can be available if a specific device and driver is, is installed. You have image services which enable you to communicate with other loaded drivers and you have other miscellaneous services as well. So handle based are not, are, are specific functionality. They're not available everywhere and they're only there if you create a handle or there's other devices uh, which, uh, other device drivers we have, which have created that handle as well. 
So those were the boot services. You also have the runtime services, which are uh, available throughout the actual uh, loading process. So as long as the uh, machine is running, those runtime services are available. Uh, yet again, these uh, functions are also global and handle based, and you can dynamically create them as well. Uh, unlike uh, the boot services, uh, these ones uh, can. Uh, uh, offer different kinds of things uh, like uh, runtime rules you can uh, create those as well uh, you can uh, access the uh, the variable services so uh, you can also create uh, you can access time and other things like uh, keyboard and so on and so forth they're also handle based as well so you can create more on the fly so how do developers actually use these kinds of, of, of available tools? Uh, so there's a, there's a specific package uh, available online. It, it's, a, it's a free download and it's called an FE development kit or EDK2. Uh, it's based on the Intel's uh, reference implementation and it enables you to write uh, EFI applications in C. Uh, it does have its own uh, standard lib implementation, but it's not really the, the, the C you know uh, already. Uh, it only offers a small portion of the C library, and that is because it's been basically wrapped around these available services, which basically enable you to uh, allocate memory, communicate with devices, and so on. So only a small subset of C programming language is available. However, it, it's good enough for you to actually work with memory, allocate pointers, and so on. Uh, that enables you to easily write uh, EFI drivers and um, I'll show you uh, an example in, in a sec. So it has a lot of packages uh, which are available there as well. Uh, it, it has a shell so you can actually type stuff in command line. It has uh, crypto functions. Uh, it offers some emulation capabilities. There's even a Python reference implementation. So you can even uh, use Python from the EFI layer to script around your drivers and, and do whatever you uh, want with that. Uh, when you write those applications, uh, the uh, EDK actually supports to use many different compilers uh, at all. Uh, you can use Visual Studio's compiler, you can use the GCC one, you can use the Xcode, uh, it's all fine, it all compiles all, almost to the binary exact uh, images uh, regardless of uh, the platform you used. Uh, so uh, it supports many different CPUs. So uh, EA64, uh, which includes both 32 bit and 64 bit architectures, and ARM architecture as well. Uh, here you would have a sample of how this application would actually look like if you were to write it uh, with uh, the help of uh, the EDK. So it's a standard C application which has uh, the number of arguments passed to the program and all of those uh, parameters as. Uh, uh, as strings as well. So, so this is something you can use from the ED case, but this is not the way you actually write uh, UFI applications. Uh, this uh, entry point, which you created here, so shell app main, is basically wrapped around the natural way uh, the UFI applications are written. So, the next slide actually shows that. So, this main function still takes two parameters. So, the first one will be the handle of the image uh, you are at. So, handle of your image and then you have a pointer to the system table which actually consists of pointers to uh, boot and runtime services. So th these are the functions you can actually use and uh, the previous example was just a wrapper around this to make it more like uh, C uh, code. So you C programmers feel at home. But we would be using these uh, pointers na natively because they enable us to access functions which enable us to uh, create events, to uh, basically inspect memory, to see other images, to access firmware and so on. The, the functions are located in this kind of structure. So uh, naturally uh, there, there is a way to actually abuse all of this, uh, all of this unified interface uh, as well because all of that is pre pretty much uh, open to whoever's writing the driver. So if you write a driver, you have access to the entire machine. There's almost no restrictions about you accessing a part of the memory. So you can imagine like writing a user mode application but having all of other drivers loaded in the same address space. It, it's basically like that because you can access all the memory regardless of uh, memory permissions at, at, at all. So you can install hooks, you can override drivers, you can unload images. Basically the, the EFI layer is trusting you to do the right thing and uh, 
you might uh, choose to abuse that as well. That is why uh, the concepts like secure boot have been uh, introduced as well. So there's, there has been some previous work and research about boot kits and how you can create those as well. Uh, so <coughs> uh, the previous work uh, w uh, which happened in uh, 07 uh, was presented uh, here uh, at Black Hat uh, and uh, what they did is they modified the uh, NVRAM variables, uh, they injected some code and uh, they showed how you can abuse system management mode basically. Uh, that was followed uh, by last year's talk uh, which, which uh, Snare did and uh, he showed how you can patch the Mac OS kernel if you had a maliciously loaded uh, EFI driver and he uh, introduced the concept of uh, evil made attacks for the EFI layer. Uh, and just this year uh, at uh, Hack in the Box in Amsterdam, uh, one of the first uh, boot kits for uh, the Windows 8 was uh, presented. Uh, his uh, approach was quite similar to ours. Uh, uh, if you compare the way that Dream Boot works and compare uh, the way our uh, Mac OS uh, boot kit works, they are quite uh, similar in the case that you have to uh, hook uh, certain things and you have to inject code as well uh, to be able to uh, execute uh, commands at, at a much higher level. Uh, we'll go in a, in, in a, in a bit more uh, detail later on of how did, did we create our own boot kit but here is, is a simple diagram which shows how Dream Boot actually operates. At certain layers uh, hooks are, are installed which uh, redirect code uh, to uh, maliciously loaded drivers uh, which then install callbacks which are executed when certain events events in, in Windows happen. So that enables privilege escalation attacks uh, and so on. So that, that brought us to RDFU which is a rootkit detection framework uh, for the UFI layer. It's as we mentioned before it's a DARPA sponsored project and we'd like to thank DARPA yet again. So what, what actually is RDFU? So RDFU is, is a set of applications and drivers that enable you to list all uh, loaded drivers in the EFI environment. You can probe the entire uh, memory range, you can scan for executables that might be hidden, uh, you can monitor all drivers which are loaded before the operating system starts, you can uh, start uh, listing and scanning uh, the boot and runtime services for modified function pointers that will be shown as well. So if checksums uh, are not matching on specific images that is displayed in the log, all of those files are automatically dumped uh, as well so you can analyze them uh, later on as well. Uh, we are also continuously monitoring both the boot and the runtime services while the operating system is being loaded, making sure that none of those modifications occur uh, while uh, our uh, RDFU is loaded. Uh, we can also list uh, uh, all events which are happening and uh, it also works as a standalone because uh, the EFI uh, specification says that shell is uh, absolutely optional so you might choose not to implement shell if you don't want to. Uh, RDFU would work even though if, if there's no shell so it comes with, on, with, its, with its own graphical user interface which you can use to access all of its functionality. So what does it support? Uh, it supports uh, the both uh, the older specification so 1.x and the latest one for both 32 bit and 64 bit environments as well. It supports a specific Mac OS implementation of the UFI. It works on the virtual box even though virtual box currently uh, the latest version I checked though uh, does have an, an uh, EFI shell but it's incapable of actually installing an operating system on their EFI. Uh, they are still working on that. VMware has much better support uh, and you can actually use uh, the FI layer. It has a shell, you can actually install the operating system and it works just fine. Uh, currently uh, we do not support EFI for uh, ARM because there's only one implementation and that's Surface RT and that implementation already has secure boot uh, enabled by default and that's why we opted not to support that one because you should be uh, pretty safe and there's no need for you to actually scan uh, those devices. So how does uh, RDFU work? Uh, there's a couple of options. Uh, you can actually load the driver if there's an uh, UFI shell enabled. You can create a bootable thumb drive which you can just plug into the machine and then the uh, then the RDFU would be uh, executed automatically. Uh, then you can actually scan your uh, entire machine for uh, drivers which should not be there or modified firmware as well. 
uh, then uh, it has a scanner application which wor uh, works under uh, UFI shell. You, can, you have to actually have UFI shell to execute it. Uh, while it's executing, it's logging and dumping all the information which it finds on the, onto the mounted hard drive or uh, to the thumb drive from which it was loaded. So here is an example of how that would look like. So this is uh, you actually using uh, the uh, RDFU framework under VMware. Uh, while you are booting the system you would actually uh, just press a button to uh, select the boot manager. Uh, that brings you to the option of actually selecting which kind of boot device would you like to load. Uh, there's an option called uh, internal shell. Even though it says it's an unsupported option it actually works just fine. So you are prompted to the uh, to the shell of the EFI interface where you can actually start and, and load the uh, RDFU uh, which comes with its loading screen and then comes with a set of options which enable you to do all sorts of cool things. So uh, it has a lot of options. Uh, the first would be to list all the handles which are present in the machine. Uh, that would be equivalent to protocols as well. You can list all images, dump all images to the disks. You can later on inspect them. You can check the pointers. Uh, you can list all the events. You can basically brute force scan uh, the, the memory to try to find any images which should not be there. Uh, so if somebody has dynamically allocated memory and put an, put an image there to basically execute it, that will be uh, detected as well. You can display the memory map, uh, you can dump the firmware, uh, show the uh, IDT and GDT as well and you can install resident scanners. That's an option which enables you to actually install RDFU so it monitors uh, the entire loading process until the operating system starts. Now this is this was us actually uh, running EFI from shell. Other things have been loaded before this. But uh, the EFI shell comes with a startup script which enables you to install this as a resident scanner so it's uh, automatically executed every time you boot the machine. Th there's that option or you can actually manually install it if you have uh, root privileges or you are are actually uh, simulating the process of installing an operating system. Uh, so uh, we're going to show a demo of how this RDFU actually works. Uh, I'm going to be using the uh, VMware implementation so uh, to show that that works correctly. So we, we've started the uh, oh sorry I actually have to do this. So as I mentioned before uh, you'd have to select the boot manager option and there you have the uh, internal shell. When you go back to that it actually loads and um, it, uh, it enables you to uh, do shell commands. So things like uh, listing files and so on uh, can be supported depending on what the actual uh, implementation of uh, um, unified uh, extensible interface you are working with. So this one actually uh, has uh, our uh, RDFU uh, installed on, uh, on a separate uh, hard drive. So here I've uh, mounted that drive and I've shown you that all of those things are there. So all I need to do now is load our scanner. So load EFI scanner application. This is a 64 bit application so we are loading a driver uh, which will show the logo of our tool and then uh, following that uh, you'll have all of the options which are available. So for example we're just going to list all of the handles which are uh, available and we can dump uh, the firmware as well. So we can uh, dump the firmware ROM, that's G and that's uh, now dumped on the same uh, hard drive. You can actually uh, do your analysis there. Uh, you can do a brute force scanning for other uh, installed uh, EFI drivers uh, that will be listed here as well uh, in, the, in the log. So uh, we're just going to quit now and I'm going to show you that uh, the EFI actually comes with uh, the with some tools which enable you to actually inspect this without actually going uh, to Windows or any other operating system to actually uh, view the, those things. So this would be just uh, you inspecting that log uh, with uh, a text editor which is basically available uh, with uh, this implementation of the EFI shell. So at the end as you can see we've dumped the firmware. Uh, it, it's on our uh, USB thumb drive and you can uh, inspect it later on, uh, load it in IDA Pro or anything like that. So that is how uh, how, how the um, how the RDFU works. So next uh, we will be 
So one sec. So next we will be talking about the specific bootkit which we, we ourselves wrote for uh, the Mac OS. And uh, we will go into details of how this uh, bootkit was created and uh, what, what uh, was uh, our intention with this tool as well. So we had a goal uh, and that was uh, to do uh, certain things uh, which uh, normal bootkits and rootkits would be doing and that is creating uh, hidden content so creating hidden folders uh, even uh, restoring that uh, uh, restoring those folders as well so we wanted to be able to hide running processes and uh, show them back again as well. We wanted to have uh, uh, an ability to elevate privilege and have a shell which gives us root privilege so we can do anything we want and the bonus points would be us retrieving default uh, file vault uh, password if it was available. So uh, how does uh, this uh, bootkit work? So uh, we've tested this on the live uh, Mac OS machine. Uh, we don't have one present today. However, uh, the VMware implementation uh, will suffice. So uh, for that, uh, if you were using this on a live machine, uh, the, the option would be uh, just using the uh, RDFU to create uh, a bootable uh, USB thumb drive uh, which uh, can enable you to uh, basically boot uh, an OS. To that thumb drive you just copy our bootkit code which automatically scans all the partitions and then the selects Mac OS, loads it and does all of the things we mentioned in, in a sec uh, automatically. So since we don't have a Mac MacBook uh, present, uh, here is uh, what we opted to do. We wanted to do this in, in VMware. Uh, so uh, the VMware is perfectly fine because Mac OS can run in it. Uh, it, it runs in it only if you have an unofficial patch sadly. Uh, so you have to patch your uh, VMware to be able to actually execute uh, uh, Mac OS under it and the only thing you have to add after that is make sure that the VMX file has the firmware option EFI enabled. That enables the VMware uh, to actually run with the EF EFI interface. Uh, after that uh, Mac OS is installed and it has a support for uh, the version 1.10 of the EFI stand standard. So how does the bootkit work? Uh, here's a typical workflow. Uh, the, EF, uh, the UFI is loaded. Uh, it uh, loads our uh, malicious driver which then uh, uh, registers for an event and this event is called uh, virtual address change and that means that uh, when this event is fired basically the operating system is being loaded. So uh, all the drivers uh, which are still running, uh, all the runtime drivers which are still running uh, have to adjust uh, for uh, transitioning from the uh, physical addressing mode to the virtual, virtual addressing mode and this is what uh, this event uh, will do. Uh, we also uh, hooked a specific system table uh, function which is read keystroke uh, that enables us uh, to actually uh, sniff all the keys the user has, has typed in uh, while booting uh, the machine. Uh, the idea here is that uh, if file vault uh, is installed then uh, the user has to enter the password and that ha comes through the keyboard so since we are logging all the keys we would get this password uh, once the system is loaded. So there's a fail safe unless uh, uh, if something goes wrong, we've uh, registered ourselves for the unload protocol, which means that uh, our loading has failed and we just have to um, uh, cl basically clean up. After that, we have to load Mac OS because our bootkit has been installed. So lo uh, loading Mac OS is basically enumerating all drives which has a, have a specific EFI image present. Uh, user has a choice of selecting uh, which EFI uh, boot EFI gets loaded if there are multiple ones but if there's just one found uh, we automatically boot to it as well. So we just call load image to uh, load that EFI image and then we start it. So uh, that, at that point uh, Mac OS starts the booting process and we get signaled uh, by the event when the Mac OS bootloader calls uh, set virtual address map. So that triggers that event which I mentioned which is the uh, virtual uh, which is the virtual address change. That tells us the Mac OS is ready to be booted and that the next command it will uh, it will call is the one which actually unloads all the uh, all the drivers which are uh, running only during the boot. 
Uh, that uh, triggers the uh, part of the code which actually locates the syscall table and from that syscall table we are just hooking a few functions uh, which enable us to do uh, all those things we set uh, to do. Uh, so we are hooking the set UID, get uh, directory entries, uh, get their attributes and, and syscall as well. So how do we actually get root? This is a small C application which actually enables you to get root. Uh, so we try to set our user ID to uh, a specific number. This specific number has been hard coded inside the, the boot kit. So as soon as our boot kit in, in the kernel level sees this user ID, uh, it knows to elevate the privilege of that process uh, to root. So how do we hide processes? This is yet another short snippet which is basically us uh, uh, running a syscall event uh, with uh, with a uh, with a set of parameters, uh, which are analyzed by the bootkit itself, which then knows what to do. And in, the, in in this case, it is just adding a new process to be hidden. Uh, so uh, with that, we have a demo of how that actually works. And uh, let me just boot up macOS once again. So yet again, uh, since I'm using the uh, the VMware implementation, this actually has this actually has to uh, be done manually. If I was using a physical machine, I could just plug in a thumb drive, and all of this would be happening automatically. The only thing I had to do is select that I want to boot from a thumb drive. So this, I go to the internal shell option, and then. I basically just go to the mounted hard drive and load the bootkit code. That automatically finds uh, the macOS partition, it l loads its uh, boot EFI code and it's patched all the things uh, uh, behind it. So uh, what's uh, happening now is the OS is loading, that could take a while since we are on the uh, virtual machine implementation. Once we uh, we we have booted, uh, I'll log in and I'll show you that all the functionality uh, which we mentioned, which is uh, hiding processes, uh, hiding folders, and so on, actually does work. So we're loading, and that's going to give us in, into the shell. So uh, here, uh, as as you can see, uh, we can do all sorts of things. Uh, here I have all those applications written in, in, in C, and they have all been compiled, so we don't have to do that again. Uh, so let, let's do the first thing first. Uh, let's hide this process. So the process ID for Bash currently is 140, so I can just add uh, add PID 140, and that's uh, going to be uh, hidden now. As you can see, process list is is basically empty. Uh, we can unhide that as well by uh, remove PID, so the same PID, and then we can show that this process is now visible yet again. In addition to that, uh, we can create a hidden folder, so MK there. So it, it's actually hard coded to to this first string, but the other part of the string you can type in anything you like. So a listing of directories actually doesn't show this one, but it's accessible uh, anyway. So we are in this folder. There are no files there, but we can just create one. And as you can see, there's a file there now. So we can just remove that since we don't need it. And go back one level to remove that folder. So yet again, the folder is uh, gone, but it wasn't shown there as well. The last thing we need to do is to elevate privilege. So currently I'm a user, but if I wanted to get root, all, all I had to do is execute shell. Th that C code, as you remember, has only two lines. So executing shell and then uh, we got root. Uh, from this point we can do anything we like. We can even install our bootkit permanently by uh, accessing the EFI partition and installing it so it uh, loads every time. So the bootkit right now it, it is loaded but if I were to reboot uh, it would not be loaded at all. So all of the changes I've done uh, would not matter. So all of those hidden folders would be visible. So the bootkit is only in memory. So that concludes the, uh, the bootkit presentation. And that brings us to to the reminder of our talk. 
so we've done all this and here that was the demo. So uh, what can you do with RDFU? Uh, you can use the EFI shell, some of its functionality even though uh, even if there is no EFI shell available. Uh, as I said, uh, the uh, documentation and specification does not require shell to be present. You can check which are the installed and loaded EFI components. You can scan the environment for hidden ones and you can actually modify its source code to make it uh, act like secure boot. So we can actually check all of the installed uh, and uh, running uh, drivers and you can unload uh, things uh, you don't like or you can just report them as well. Uh, for that you would have to modify the source code. Which brings us to where you, can, where you can get it. So it's available on our website now. You can go and download the source code. Uh, you can get almost everything. The only thing we have not pub publicly, uh, we have not published is the bootkit source code uh, because uh, this was a DARPA sponsored project. We wouldn't be feeling comfortable to release a code which actually does malicious things. So the scanner and its source code are actually available on our website right now. That concludes our talk but uh, we are, f uh, we will be taking uh, questions and answers. So. Go ahead. Uh, so the bootkit, so how, how can you install a bootkit permanently and uh, well uh, you do that manually by uh, b basically writing it over the uh, original uh, loader code uh, so, so for the Mac OS and then you can just rename that to any, any other application and load it normally. So you can do that. How would they remove it? The uh, well, uh, the EFI partition from from the EFI layer is read only. So the only way to actually remove it is from the operating system. So the, the same way we install that, you can uninstall it as well, just by overwriting it, it with the original binary. Uh, with the RDFU, no. RDFU is just a scanner. It doesn't prevent anything. It just reports things. Yeah, we can. You, you have a potential to do that uh, if you uh, modify the source code. Then you have a. Pro, uh, you can basically go through the entire file system, make sure that those uh, images are still correct, and you are basically uh, implementing your own secure boot. Any other questions? It's it, it's actually loaded by the, it's available through the firmware. So the firmware is is the thing which enables you to use these uh, this functionality. It's actually in the ROM, uh, and you can actually dump it with our tool. Can you load RDFU from the OS? Uh, no, no, you have to be at the EFI level, but you can create a bootable thumb drive, which uh, just enables you to boot RDFU normally and then just run the uh, run the uh, operating system after that. No, there's no OS level usage of it. It has to be loaded before the operating system. Anybody else? So if I'm not missing anybody, that will be it. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.